welcome back to Wildlife Wednesday here at Humane at Home. My name is Kate and I'm so excited to have you here today. We have lots of fun things to talk about and I even have a really cool animal to introduce to you in just a second. First things first though, of course, we're gonna start with our little disclaimer that here at San Diego Humane Society, we're being very careful. As you can see, I have my nice gloves on and I have my mask on that I'm starting with to show you that we're being very careful. We're social distancing, we're wearing our protective equipment and we hope that you are too and you're being safe out there. Um, I know everything is opening up again. Some things are starting to reopen, but I wanna make sure you guys are still staying safe to keep yourselves healthy and everyone around you healthy too. But for this episode, so that you can hear me a little bit better, I'm gonna take my mask off, but leave my gloves on because I have a really fun ambassador to handle today. So I don't know if you've already gotten a sneak peek at the screen up here, but we are talking about snakes today. Now, if you remember on Monday, talking about how to keep our pets cool during these warmer summer months. So even in an area like San Diego where we have beautiful weather year round, we even start to see an increase in temperatures during the summer months. So we wanna make sure we're keeping our pets nice, nice and cool and safe during these hotter months. We also have to be mindful of snakes during these summer months and that goes for our pets as well as us. So we are going to be talking about some of the different snake species that are found here in San Diego, specifically yours and my friend, the rattlesnake, because I know everybody hates them and is terrified of them, but they are actually so cool and so important to have in the environment. So we're gonna learn a little bit more about them. I have some really cool pictures and videos to show you and I'm going to introduce you in just a second to our amazing Project Wildlife Ambassador who you can see her little tail peeking out of her little Heidi log right now so I'm going to leave her covered so we can keep the surprise going but she will be coming out in just one second. So to kick us off starting um, talking about snakes today we are going to be talking about all the different ones that are found in San Diego. So San Diego, of course, as we know, is an incredible biodiversity hotspot, meaning there are tons of different animal and plant species here and found here year round. Snakes, of course, are one of them. So there are about 3,000 different snake species found across the planet. Here in California, we have around 30. And here in San Diego specifically, we have most of those species. So we are going to be talking a lot about the ones that we find here, of course, in beautiful San Diego. Now, typically the first question that people always ask when we're talking about snakes, or even when I bring out our ambassador snake who is still hiding, they wanna know, is she poisonous or is he poisonous? And I have a quick correction for you friends out there. If you already know snakes well, then you know what I'm going to say. Snakes. That, like you're thinking of like rattlesnakes or vipers ones that inject venom into people are actually called venomous so they're not poisonous snakes at all they're actually called venomous they're still toxic so if they are biting and injecting something into your skin like a snake does or even like a bee does with its little stinger they're actually considered venomous animals so there's not poisonous they're venomous poison is anything that if you touch it or if you breathe it in or if you accidentally eat it and it's toxic to you then it's considered poisonous but for the snakes that we're going to be talking about, they are actually venomous. And of those 3,000 species that I just mentioned that are found all over the world, only about a fifth are actually venomous. So most of them are non-venomous. So a couple of the ones that are frequently seen here in San Diego are our California king snake, our ring-necked snake, we have gopher snakes everywhere. That's definitely one of the most common. Striped racers, garter snakes are really common, and red coach whips. And these are just a few of some of the really cool snakes we have here. You can see they all have very different colorings. And snakes, even within a certain species, can look completely different from one another. So just because this is what one garter snake or one gopher snake looks like, that doesn't mean like that's what all of them look like. They can have very different colorings and patterns depending on where they live. So their coloring and pattern helps them to blend in. So obviously, if they're living in a more desert environment, they want to blend in with sand and be like a light tan color. Um, but if they're living in a more mountainous or rocky environment, they want to be a little darker. So it totally depends on where they live and what they're trying to blend into. So I have with me today our Project Wildlife Ambassador, who is a tiny little rosy boa. And oh my goodness, she wasn't even just underneath the little hidey hole. She is actually completely underneath the sawdust. Her name is Druk, and if you can't already tell, she is a shy little lady. So I'm just gonna scoop her up. She's going even underneath the water because I want you to get a really close and personal look at her. So this, my friends, is Druk. 
And Druk, like I mentioned, is a little rosy boa. Now she was brought into Project Wildlife back in 2011. So she's about nine years old and she's thinking, um, Kate, put me back down in the sawdust. I want to hide, but I want you guys to get a nice close and personal look with her. So she was brought to us back in 2011 and you might be able to notice something different about Druk's little neck. Can you see that there? That is a little bump and it's caused from a spinal deformity that she was actually born with. So Druk here was born into the exotic pet trade, meaning a lot of people see snakes, maybe, oops, sorry about that. A lot of people see snakes like Druk here, specifically rosy boas, and they notice that they're really docile and they have a really easygoing temperament and they think, oh, they would make a really cool pet. And so a lot of people want animals like these as pets because they just think they're really, really cool. But I want to remind everybody that if you ever do want a pet like this, you have to make sure that you are able to care for them. We have lots of amazing domestic animals at San Diego Humane Society that are looking for homes. But if you really appreciate wildlife and you really think they're cool, we know probably the best thing to do is to leave them in the wild. If, however, you have your heart set on getting an animal like cute little Druk here, there are some exotic rescues that you can adopt from who have taken animals out of bad situations and that will rehome them with you and make sure that you are going to give them the best home. So make sure even with exotic animals, if you're ever interested in them, you're still wanting to rescue and adopt them. So Drew Kier was born into the exotic pet trade and they realized really quickly, uh-oh, with that bump, it's probably going to be pretty hard for us to find her a home because it's actually really hard to feed Drew Kier. So because of that bump, she can't really open her mouth very wide, meaning that our caregiver, who houses her and takes care of her, actually has to hand feed her little rat slurries and mouse slurries and things like that. So she requires a little bit of extra care. Now, rosy boas, as you can see, are very, very docile snakes. They are actually considered one of the slowest moving snakes in the world. So if you can guess what their average speed on the ground is, and you can kind of see how slow Druk is going, their average speed on the ground is about one mile an hour. It is so, so, so slow. So they are incredibly docile and they definitely prefer, like you all just saw when I pulled her out, they definitely prefer to stay hidden and to make sure that they're not out in the open where predators can see them or anything like that. So a couple things that are common to all snakes are that they are carnivorous, meaning they eat meat or they hunt animals. So maybe a snake like a rosy boa, like Drew here, will usually wait in ambush or she'll try to stalk her prey really, really, really quietly. Because as you can imagine, if she is going one mile an hour, she's not hunting anything very quickly. So she has to wait for her prey to come by her. And that's when she makes her little sneak attack. Uh, some snakes that are a little bit faster are able to hunt their prey. And a lot of people are really interested. I'm just gonna change the slide really quick. Sorry, Miss Druk. A lot of people are really interested. Oh, and there's her little close up, my bad are interested in how snakes eat because they think, oh my goodness, if they eat something way bigger than themselves, how do they swallow it? They're not chewing it. I've never seen a snake sitting with a little fork and knife cutting up its food. They actually have to swallow their food whole. So if they're eating something a lot bigger than themselves, how is that possible? Snakes have a lot of really, really cool adaptations that allow them to swallow things that are much bigger than their throats or their mouths. So you can see right here how their jaw is built. So if you friends at home feel your jaw right here at the joint, you can feel that the top of our jaw is fused with the rest of our skull and the bottom jaw is fused to the top of the joint. So we can only open our mouth just up and down, up and down, no other movement. Snakes, however, have really, really cool bones and ligaments or stretchy materials that help them to open their mouths super, super wide. So for example, this stretchy ligament helps it to open a lot wider. These bones and these bones on top can actually move outwards and even independent from the other side. And that all helps them to open their mouths really, really wide and to swallow things that are maybe four times as big as their little mouths. So they can actually open their mouths up to 150 degrees. So if you think of a flat line as 180, they're opening their mouth almost completely flat. It is absolutely amazing. And that's what helps them to eat things that are a little bit bigger. Do we have a question? Yes, Lauren would like to know, do snakes have good vision? 
Oh, that's an excellent question. Somebody, Lauren is asking if snakes have good vision. And yes, snakes actually do have pretty good vision. Um, they do rely kind of on their eyesight, but their most heightened sense is actually their sense of smell, which perfect segue, Lauren, is what we're talking about next. So their best sense of their best sense is their sense of smell. And a lot of people think it kind of works um, with their sense of taste. So you might have seen when a snake is moving around, it'll flick its tongue out and then pull it back in and flick it out and pull it back in. It might even move it up and down a little bit. Miss Drew here obviously can't really do that because her mouth doesn't open for her. However, most snakes will do this. And what they're doing when they're flicking their tongue out is they're catching little scent particles on the tips of their tongue. They then pull their tongue back in. They push those scent particles up into this little organ called the Jacobson's organ. And then that is what funnels those scents to their brain. And that's what help them, helps them process what they're smelling, what's around them, if maybe there's a food or a potential threat around them, and whether or not they should stay or flee the scene. So they have a really, really incredible sense of smell, as well as um, a good sense of eyesight too. So yeah, they use all those different senses, and they're also very, very sensitive to vibrations in the ground. So you will notice snakes do not have any sort of visible outer ear. So a lot of people think they're completely deaf, but that's actually not true. They do have a complete inner ear. We just can't see it, of course. But because it is inside and they don't have an outer ear that's capturing sounds, most of the time the sounds that they're hearing are really, really low frequency or they're just really feeling vibrations from the ground. So obviously, since most of their body is always on the ground, they're really sensitive to if somebody is walking nearby or if a prey or a predator is nearby, that's definitely what helps them. The last thing I wanted to mention about snakes, because I honestly just think this is really cute, this is the belly of a snake. And you can see some of these scales are a little bit bigger and wider. Those are called ventral scales. Drew has them underneath her little belly. I'll try to show you in a way that doesn't bother her. But those little scales are called scoots, and they are what helps snakes to slither around and to move about, to climb things, and they are what helps the snakes to get around. And I think that is so cute that they're called little scoots. So now you can see that snake is scooting around all over the place. It's adorable. And Druk is scooting all over the place. She's honestly probably a little weirded out. Like, why are these blue plastic hands holding me? I know, Druk, I'm sorry. You are almost done, I promise. You might have also seen snakes sunning themselves outside. And this is especially true. People see rattlesnakes all the time sunning themselves outside. This is so important for snakes to do. If you've ever heard of reptiles being ectotherms, then you get a bonus point. All reptiles, including snakes, are what we call ectotherms, meaning they cannot regulate their own body temperature. So for example, if it's really, really cold outside, Druk's little body here can't heat up on its own. So she might have to burrow really deep or coil up really tight to sort of try to warm herself back up. But that also means if she gets cold and it's daylight and it's a nice hot day, she can just go out onto a trail or like this rattlesnake is doing, they'll sun themselves to help themselves heat back up. So this is important just for their survival, just to make sure they're maintaining a good temperature. And it also helps them to digest a meal. So if maybe they just caught something and they need the sun and the heat to help them to break that food down, you might see a snake sitting out on a trail, on a hike, or maybe even in your yard, things like that. And the most important thing I wanna let you guys know about snakes is they are really non-aggressive animals. So especially rattlesnakes, people think that if they see one or if there are any nearby, they're gonna come out and try to hunt you or hurt you or get you. That is not true, friends. You might've noticed Carly and me, every time we're talking about wildlife, what we really want to tell you guys is that they don't want any trouble from us. Remember, we are bigger than most wild animals that you'll come across in San Diego. That makes us the big scary predators. So even if you're really scared of that rattlesnake, think about it from his perspective. He is a fraction of your size. He's stuck on the ground. He's terrified of you. So if you ever see a snake lying out, sunning themselves, you definitely wanna make sure that you're just leaving them alone, giving them a wide berth, and making sure that they are staying safe and you are staying safe too. 
So here's a couple of other just pictures of actually rosy boas. These are all rosy boas, and I thought this was just cool to show you all how different they can look. So again, it depends on where they're living, what they want to blend into, but Miss Drook here doesn't really look like any of them, huh? She's a little bit darker. But all snakes can be a variety of different colors. Now we're going to get into the best topic, rattlesnakes. Everyone's favorite. I know you're all so excited. This slide is going to show you the four species of rattlesnakes that we have here in San Diego. These four species of rattlesnakes are the only venomous snakes that we have here in San Diego County. So there are a couple other ones scattered throughout California, but here in San Diego, we have the Southern Pacific, also called the Western, and that's definitely the most commonly seen. We have a red diamond, we have a sidewinder, and we have what's called the Southwestern Speckled. And you can see all four of these look pretty different. And they all live in pretty much the same habitats, um, except for the Sidewinder who is found pretty much exclusively in the desert. The rest of these three can be found in pretty much any area. So you might have seen a Southern Pacific or a Western before because they are the most likely to be around or near homes. So those are the ones you definitely want to be cautious of. But again, you always want to be cautious of every single rattlesnake that might be out there. So to identify a rattlesnake, there are of course two main things that you want to look for. You want to look for that diamond shaped triangular head and the reason it's shaped like that is because they actually store their venom glands in the sides of their faces and that's why it sort of bulges out. So you'll notice for most other snakes, specifically non-venomous ones, their head is pretty much the same width as their neck. Now, obviously, Miss Drook here is kind of a poor example of that because of her little bump, but you can see their heads pretty much go straight into their neck and the rest of their body. However, with rattlesnakes, it's very obviously a lot bigger than the rest of their neck. And of course, they have that signature rattle. Now, a lot of people think that you can just count the segments on a rattletail's rattle, a rattletail, a rattlesnake's rattle, and that will tell you how old they are. However, snakes shed all of the time. They can shed multiple times a year. And every time a rattlesnake sheds, it adds a new segment onto that rattle. So for example, if a snake sheds four times in a year, if a rattlesnake sheds four times, it's gonna add four new links. So does that mean it's four years old? No, it just means maybe it's young and it's growing fast, or it got a lot of good food and it's growing fast, but that's not really a good way to tell how big it is. However, you can just assume however big it is, if it's really, really long, then it's definitely an older snake. And a lot of people are familiar with the sound, and I have a little audio clip of what it sounds like, if I can get this to play. So you can hear how fast that is. And remember, when a rattlesnake is rattling its tail, is that it just saying, I'm really excited, or I'm having a good day? No, friends, a rattlesnake's rattle is sort of like a dog's growl. It is its way of warning you saying, I am feeling unsafe, I am feeling threatened, and I'd really prefer if you leave me alone. So remember, if you ever are out hiking or in rattlesnake territory in an area where you know those snakes might be, be very, very cautious. You always want to respect the space when you hear a rattlesnake rattle, and you also don't want to rely solely on hearing a rattle. So just because you don't hear that signature sound doesn't mean there aren't rattlesnakes there. You always want to be mindful of where you are, where you're stepping, where you're reaching your hands to make sure that you're staying safe and you're not going to threaten the snake and the threatened won't or the snake won't feel like they have to bite you because they feel threatened. A fun fact about the rattle before we move on is the, the muscle that controls that rattle is one of the fastest muscles in the entire animal kingdom. So a rattlesnake can move his rattle up to 50 to 100 times per second. That's about as fast as a hummingbird flaps its wings. So they can move that rattle really, really quickly. It is such an incredible tool that they use. Here's just another really quick graphic to show you how much bigger a rattlesnake's head is than other non-venomous snakes and that their tail comes to a more blunt tip with their rattle, whereas other non-venomous ones come to a point. So those are just a few ways that you can tell if it's a rattlesnake or not. Obviously though, friends, I don't really want you ever getting close enough to a snake to be able to see what kind it is. If you ever do see a snake, make sure you alert your parents, you tell your responsible adult, and you give them lots and lots of space. 
So if you or your pet is ever bitten, I hope this never happens or has happened to you. But unfortunately, it does happen pretty often, specifically to our dog friends and on their faces and paws when they're sniffing around and being really curious. So the first thing you wanna do is limit your movement and remain as calm as possible. I know that's way easier said than done because if you get bitten by a snake, that's terrifying and all you wanna do is run around. However, if you get bitten by a rattlesnake or your pet does and you start running around or you let your pet start running around, all that's doing is gonna increase your blood flow and it's gonna make, it's gonna pump that venom faster throughout your body. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure you stay as calm as possible, limit your movement and pick up your pet if possible. You wanna remove anything that might restrict circulation because you are gonna start swelling. So typically, rattlesnakes, after they bite you, that area will start swelling within about 10 minutes. So you wanna make sure that you're taking off jewelry, rings, bracelets, necklaces. And for our pets, you wanna remove collars as long as you know the pet is in a safe place, like in your car with you or is crated or in a place that you know he's not gonna run away. So make sure that you're being safe still. If you can, you can wash the wound with soap and water. And please, none of those crazy, crazy field remedies. So please, no cutting into wounds. Don't try to suck the venom out like they do in movies. It is not gonna go well. Please don't try to use tourniquets or apply ice, anything like that. The best thing you can do is remain calm and get to the hospital or to the vet if it's your pet as soon as possible, okay? Because venom can really start to hurt you if you don't get treatment within just a few hours. So I wanna make sure that everybody's staying really, really safe. However, there's about seven to 8,000 people that get bitten every single year in the United States by a rattlesnake. Less than 1% of those ever ends in somebody passing away. So it is actually really, really, really rare for anybody to get seriously injured from a rattlesnake bite. And friends, most of the time when people get bitten, it's because we were messing with the snake, not the other way around. So again, make sure that you're giving them lots of space. And I also wrote this cheeky little comment and turn over your credit cards because it is so expensive, friends. For every single bite of, um, every single piece of venom that a snake injects into you, you're gonna need some anti-venom and that is sold in vials. And those vials can be thousands of dollars each and you might need multiple of them. So a man just a few years ago, I believe he lived in Texas, had to spend over $150,000 after he got bitten by a rattlesnake. So the best thing we can do is just avoid them. Make sure you're always alert when hiking, you're wearing boots and pants if possible, and you're staying on trails. You can also ask park rangers uh, where rattlesnakes have been sighted and try to avoid those trails. But we also want to make sure that our pets are staying with us on trails and leashed up. You want to avoid areas where rattlesnakes can be hiding. So like tall grasses, weeds, rock piles, anything like that. And if this, if you've ever needed a reason to mow your lawn or to trim back those bushes in your backyard, here it is. You don't want to be accidentally providing lots of coverage for a rattlesnake to call your backyard his home. So make sure that we're trimming back foliage, um, rodent proofing our houses, because if there's lots of rats and mice running around, guess who loves those? Snakes. So make sure that you're not leaving food out, that you're making sure that all the holes um, that might allow access to your home by a rat or a mouse are being plugged up so that they can't get in. And the most important thing is if you ever encounter a rattlesnake, leave them alone. They don't want any trouble from you at all, friends. All they wanna do is find a little rat or mouse to eat, they wanna sun themselves a little bit, and they want to stay as far away from us as possible. So Miss Drew here, I'm gonna put her back inside of her little house so you can see her start to slither around. And she also might need to start heating up, so I have a little heating pad underneath there that she might appreciate if she's getting a little too cold. I also have right in front of her cage, a little baby snake skin. So remember we we're just saying snakes shed their skin all the time. And you can kind of think of this little baby snake skin shed as sort of like your baby clothes. So obviously Druk was a lot smaller than this at one point. And as she started growing, she shed it out of her baby clothes. And just like us, I know I'm not walking around wearing something that I wore when I was four years old. So she's not gonna wear something she was wearing when she was one. So they grow out of their clothes just like we do. It's very, very cute. Um, the last thing I wanted to point out is that even 
uh, rattlesnakes who have passed away can still pose a threat. So even if they are dead and you come across one, please don't try to handle them. They actually have a reflex where even if they're passed away and you try to grab them or handle them, they can still bite and inject venom. So I wanna make sure that if you ever find a rattlesnake, you're giving it lots of space, call us, call a professional to help you with that rattlesnake. And here's a couple patients of some gopher snakes, actually, that we have gotten in Project Wildlife because we do still care about our snake friends, even if everybody's terrified of them. This is one who got caught in some netting. This little snake here is all fixed up after he accidentally got hurt by a weed whacker. So we help all sorts of different animals here, including snakes. Here's a really cool video of our amazing wildlife vet, Dr. John, stitching up a snake after he got dropped onto some barbed wire accidentally. And you can hear his heartbeat. So we monitor the, all of their vital signs like their heartbeat while they're getting surgery, just like you would do for a person. It is amazing. And then lastly, just to end, I wanna show you all a little release video of a gopher snake being put back out into the wild once we have treated him for all of his injuries and made sure he's okay. As with all animals, when we release them, we try to do so within a one to three mile radius of where they were found because that is their home and that's what they're familiar with. So if we release them anywhere when we got them in that would be like you going to the hospital and getting treated and then just getting dropped off in new york and expected to figure it out so we want to make sure we're returning them to their house and you can see oh, he's saying yay i'm home free i know where i am and now i get to do whatever i want out here in the wild so that is just an amazing video of a snake being returned to the wild because obviously that's what we always want to do so just another reminder, just because it's Wildlife Wednesday, if you all ever do find a wild animal that is sick or injured or orphaned, please bring them to Project Wildlife as soon as possible. I also wanna give a specific shout out to any bird nests that might be hiding in places you don't expect. So a lot of people think bird nests are only found in trees, but that's actually not true. If you have an RV, camper, car, any sort of structure that you haven't used in a while, birds even will make nests in those areas. So again, just be really mindful of of wildlife right now, whether it's baby animals, snakes that are coming out because it's warmer. I wanna make sure that we're all coexisting very well. Is Drew trying to hide? Oh, she's just exploring her little habitat there. And please, 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 friends, join us on Friday because we have a really cool episode where we're gonna be spotlighting our humane law enforcement officers. And they're gonna be telling you all sorts of really fun things about their jobs and even showing you some of the animals that they've rescued. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about what it's like to be an animal cop, definitely come back on Friday. It's gonna be amazing. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed learning about snakes and maybe you're not gonna be so scared of them or dislike them as much anymore because they're really important, just like all wild animals, and all they wanna be is left alone. So thank you all so much. I hope you're staying safe out there and we will see you on Friday. Bye.